All right, Dr. Rob, let's start off today with a fun one. How much torque is too much torque? Oh, we're twerking, huh? We're twerking. Uh, my kids would love this conversation. Where our concern in dental implants starts back in the day was with torque as it related to the fracture of the implant. So the first implants that were made were made out of a soft titanium. And thus, what they realize is that if you torqued the abutment screw to the implant greater than 30 newton centimeters in some cases, 20 newton centimeters in other cases, that you ran the risk of stripping the abutment screw inside the implant, okay? Now, what happens is, is that over time, someone gets taught you don't want to, you don't want to over torque your implant. And what ends up happening is there, the, the water gets a little murky and then somebody thinks that it's, you don't want to over torque the implant to the bone interface. Now, now you can see how all of a sudden where we had a mechanical complication early on, then people started worrying about stress to the bone. To make matters more interesting and, and, and complex, we had some you know, general theories about how we apply stress to the bone, how we apply forces to the bone, and that force distribution as a stress curve over the length of the implant. And there were some concerns initially about overstressing the bone, putting it into a pathological zone that may cause that bone to necrose, uh, to die. So uh, if you combine those two things, you get a very, very confused marketplace. You get a very, very confused uh, dental um, world that they don't know exactly what this torque thing means. Now, it's, it's rather interesting because if you step back for a second and then you visit our orthopedic colleagues, the guys that put in the hip joints and the shoulders and the knees and things like that, and you ask them, when you put your large screws, like a 6.5 millimeter diameter screw into someone's shoulder, what's your torque? Well, then they look at you and go, what do you mean? Because we don't measure torque on insertion. And you're like, really? You go, no. So your fixation screws that fix the plates to the bone, they're not, they're not being measured. And, and they go, no. And, and then you go, wow. So all, all of us in dentistry are worried about this insertion torque and the entire orthopedic world doesn't care about it at all, okay? Then if you think about, well, what about the, what about, so maybe it's not a mechanical problem anymore because we're using stronger like grade 23 medical grade titanium alloy, nearly 40% stronger than grade four. And some of the earlier implants were using grade three and two, you know, like really soft titanium. So if you say, well, what about those prostheses in the orthopedics that are hammered in? where they bore out the center of the long bone and then they take a titanium rod, they put it in there like a nail and they literally mallet it in. Well, it's held in place by friction. It's, it's a friction fit and it's all by compression of the bone. Are you worried about that? And they go, no, we don't, we do it all the time. We're not worried about that. So there seems to be a little bit of confusion about where this pressure comes from and all of that. Now, the story gets even more interesting if you think about the following fact. In many of the kits, especially the kits that have been around for maybe, let's say, a decade or so, there is a device in there that no one ever picks up, and that device is called a bone tap. The idea behind a bone tap is that if you're in really, really dense bone, after you've created your osteotomy, you can use the bone tap to cut the grooves into the bone. Then when you take the bone tap out, the grooves are inside the bone. So when you take your implant, the implant threads right into those little threads. Now here's where it gets really interesting. If you tap the bone, your insertion torque, after you tap the bone and you go to insert your implant, the insertion torque you will read will be about five Newton centimeters. Now, if you're listening to this and, and you're a dentist, you go, whoa, that's like, you know, there's a lot, like anything lower than 20, I'm worried about, you know, primary stability. And, you know, then there are rules that people have created that say, if you don't have this insertion torque, then you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't load or you shouldn't provisionalize these kinds of things. Well, we're sitting here telling you that in dense D1 bone that's been tapped, your insertion torque could be near zero. But the fact is you have an ISQ, an implant stability quotient that may be near 95 off the chart. 
Now, I, I'm using these numbers, 5% and 95%, because I did it on a cadaveric test, on a, on a cadaver, okay? So I put in an implant with five Newton centimeters of torque and the ISQ reading was 95. Now, the, it was a dead patient, so it wasn't, it wasn't implant integration. It was mechanical integration. It was mechanical stability, right? So you couldn't move this implant, right? I, I lifted the, the head off the table by the screw <laughs> and it was fixed, right? It's super, super rigid with five Newton centimeters of torque, darn near zero. So the problem we have is that we've been using torque as an analog for implant stability. And I understand why we don't have really good metrics to do that by, but it's really, really poor. What, what we do in our practice and in our institute is we teach a different approach for implant stability, and that's our five thread rule. And so the idea is that if you have five full threads on a modern implant that has about a, about a millimeter spacing between your threads or a pitch uh, between the threads of about a millimeter, if you have five of those threads engaging, engaging native bone, in other words, bone that's healed and been there for a while, like the socket walls or in a fully, uh, you know, in a fully edentulate patient where you're going into bone that's healed, okay? If you engage five or more threads, the likelihood of primary stability is excellent. And so we published that paper back in 2020, right when COVID hit, so no one read it. And we like to tease about that. But the interesting thing is that we've been tracking the results for the last couple of years because we were obviously sequestered during COVID. We had nothing better to do. And the results we're getting ready to publish, and they're, they're actually so good that it's going to be hard for people to believe. Uh, it, it, basically, if we identify that we're engaging five threads on our digital workup, our success rate for primary stability, basically getting the implant in and the patient leaving with it that day is, is almost 100%. It's, it's too good to be true. People are really going to take... Uh, take offense to it being that good, but that's how accurate it is. And that is a much better indicator of stability than torque. Where does that five thread rule come from? Just, you know, basic level. So the five thread rule came from my master's program when I was designing robots. And so in the process of designing the robots, I went to my, my uh, you know, my mentor and I said, how many threads do I need to engage in the metal with a screw for it to be stable? And he says, I, I don't really know. Go ask the guys down in the shop. Now, if you've ever worked with anyone, you know that you've got like the, the officers in the military and then you have the, 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 you know, the enlisted. And if you want to get something done, you go find a sergeant, right? And so these are like the chiefs for mechanics, right? You go down to the machine shop and the two guys down there were Skip and Mike. Mike and Skip, the two guys that ran the shop. And so I go down and say, Mike, Skip, hey, I'm trying to build this robot. I don't know how many threads I need to engage, how thick I can make the metal in order for this to work. And I go, it's five thread rule. And I said, what's that? And they go, well, you want five threads to engage in the plate, in the metal plate for, for stability. And I said, oh, that's brilliant. Well, I remembered that from all those years way back when. And when I went and I started doing dental implants, I was trying to figure out a way to get a, a rule or a guideline that we could use for getting an implant into a fresh extraction socket. Because what we wanna do is in most cases is take out the tooth and place the implant if we can with primary stability, graft the gap, seal it with a provisional if necessary or an abutment, seal the graft underneath it, let it heal so that we maintain the contours of the, of the anatomy. If we can maintain when we get to the end three months later, it's so much easier to get the final process perfect. If, if we have, if that, if that situation becomes, um, if it heals in an unfavorable manner, it shrinks. It's not to say that we can't get the papilla back, for instance. It's just that it may take extra time, extra provisionals, and maybe even some soft tissue grafting, okay? So in order to prevent those, we go for the immediate. But how do we predict immediate stability? Like, I'm taking out a tooth. How am I going to know whether this is going to go? And I said, well, I remember the five-thread rule from engineering. I said, well, does that correlate to a screw and bone. Well, then you go to the literature and you realize that there's there's just numerous reports that show that if you if you place a load on an implant in bone, the thread that's closest to the load, and in the case of an occlusal load on a tooth on an implant, 
The first thread closest to the top carries the most load. And then the second is a little less, the third, fourth, and fifth. And by the time you get to the sixth thread, there's very little load being transferred to the implant, implant to the bone. Okay, and that's been proven through finite element analysis, through photoelastic analysis, through multitudes of, of research, they all show the same thing. So I said, if the stress distribution of an implant to a bone looks almost identical to a screw to a bolt, then it would make sense that the five thread rule should carry over. So that's what we did. We started designing our cases and looking for five threads engaging a native bone. Once we started doing it, it was working. And then, of course, immediately we, we, we said, this is important. We need to get it out. So we published it so other people can use this because it becomes an amazingly powerful tool. Because prior to this, people would say, well, I've got a tooth. I'm going to take it out. How do I know I'm going to get an implant in? And if you're going guided, the last thing you want to do is do a workup, plan a guided case, have a guide made for some value, some amount of money, anywhere from $12 to $500, depending on who you, who you get it from, and you get the guide made, and then when you take the tooth out, you can't get the implant in because there's not enough bone left. Okay, then you've got this implant and a patient that you've got to manage. You've got to then tell the patient, I wasn't able to accomplish the task that I told you I was going to be able to do today. And no one wants to look bad in front of the patient. You want to look good in front of the patient. So this tool allows you, it facilitates your ability to predict the future. You look at it and you, and you look on the screen before you even do it, before you even tell the patient you can do it. You look on the screen and say, Mrs. Smith, with a high level of certainty, we're going to be able to take that tooth out and put an implant into the same day. And they're just blown away. They're like, that's amazing. And then because it's so accurate, it actually happens. You actually do what you said you're going to do, which is just amazing for the patient because they, they really have that confidence in you that you were able to, to predict an outcome before you even did it. Well, it's impressive to me, and uh, if you are not convinced by just the words of Skip and Mike, uh, we do have a video on the five-thread rule. Uh, you can watch it at the link that's going to be coming up on your screen right here. And with that said, I think it's time. Hi. Well, <laughs> hi. <laughs> yeah, it's time, it's time to start the show. Let's start the show. Hey, hey welcome. <laughs> this has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm the Smile Engineer, Dr. Robert Stanley. Out.